civilmedia.mk. Slobodno, nezavisno, otvoreno. Good afternoon, respected speakers at the conference, dear guests, media representatives and friend of, friends of media platform of uh, Civil on Facebook, Twitter and all other channels that we have. Thank you for uh, attending and thank you for following this conference. After very insightful perspectives, I might say, that we heard in the first panel, in the second panel of the conference we seek answers to the question how did this information disrupt the public discourse and encourage radically insulting rhetoric and hate speech. To give their valuable thoughts and experience on these issues, we have with us experienced and prominent members uh, of the civil society, experts, activists from media and civil society, representatives of media from several countries and from Europe who will be sharing with us their own experiences and best European and regional practices in the area. Uh, I should say that this phenomenon is endangering democracies in the region. I believe that we all have and share this opinion in, the Europe, and in Europe and in the world by looking at the public discourse of the public and the media in the region, especially on social networks. It looks like this type of rhetorics is quite present and often quite dominant. But even more important is to share our thoughts on the ways forward. Is there a recipe for the institutions, especially for the media, for civil society, which would work in dealing with these trends that endanger democracy in its essence? With these thoughts, I would like to give the floor uh, to Marion Kraske. And I would like to say some words for every of the speakers. She studied political sciences, economics, and Slavic studies, was a, Germany, uh, was a journalist for the German press agency, the first German television, the German news magazine Der Spiegel at the foreign desk for a couple of years. After that was the director for a Spiegel office in Vienna covering the Western Balkans. Um, her research focus was on uh, history, reconciliation, right-wing extremism and state and nation building processes. From 2009, worked as a trainer and consultant for various stakeholders, NGOs, institutions, uh, worldwide companies. Uh, she specialized in diversity and conflict management, intercultural competence, and media professionalization. From uh, for six years uh, until this year, she was working as a managing director of Heinrich Böll Stiftung uh, office in Sarajevo responsible for Bosnia and Herzegovina, North Macedonia and Albania. Uh, distinguished political analyst, journalist and media expert. Uh, we are glad to have you uh, here with us, Mrs. Kraske. Please uh, uh, share your thoughts about uh, how public discourse uh, is affected by this radical rhetoric and hate speech and uh, uh, do you detect some recipes or uh, 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 cures to mend this pain that all of our societies have, please. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. We had really a great cooperation with Civil um, in my time um, for Heinrich Böll uh, in, in the Balkan region. And I'm really glad that you're covering this really very um, sensitive and relevant topic today, which is really of, of global importance. And that's the reason why I'm happy to, um, yeah, to give uh, some input. I would like to focus a little bit on the global level uh, but also on the on the journalistic uh, perspective. Um, and since we do not have so much time for our input, um, I would like to start or to, to reflect a bit this very basic model of democracy. Uh, we have these three main pillars, you all know this, this is legislature, then executive powers and judi judiciary. And in the ideal world of a functioning democracy, we have also the fourth pillar, that is the media pillar. Um, with the tasks of information, delivering information, fact-based information, communication, control, and it's also the me for the media pillar important to, to, to act as a uh, corrective uh, to, the, to the people in power, also to the three other pillars I mentioned before. I think really this is very crucial to understand um, and when I started my journalistic career uh, some, some uh, decades ago, we had in Germany the Spiegel Day, that was the Monday, yeah? the, the, the public, 
um, was waiting for the Monday to, to, to be published and to, um, to read the most important facts during the week, yeah, and that was delivered by the speaker. This changed a lot, yeah, with the upcoming of the internet and the, the new importance of, of new platforms and new, new medias. Actually, I think there we had also, we saw that uh, this um, digitalization provided a lot of chances for the media sector, but we have also to state that uh, we have also, we are facing disadvantages and risks since then the news sector and the media sector has changed fundamentally. Nowadays, everybody can infuse his content, so-called news at any time in the internet. Um, and I think um, this uh, led to the following consequences. We have a bipolarity. Uh, on the first hand, we see a fact-based professional journalism, media content, you know, like always. But on the other hand, we have a flow of fake news, of disinformation, of fake news. Fake news. And these trends these are trends becoming are more and more global, global. right? Right. To our model of democracy, because it's discrediting, especially also the, the fourth pillar, the media sector, people are not anymore uh, believing what the professional media sector is, is providing, providing. It's undermining the democracies. And it's also, I mean, it led, we heard this also from the first panel, it led to several attacks worldwide on journalists that they were just doing their jobs, right? By delivering facts. So people get their information mainly from Facebook, from Instagram, from sources who are quite, uh, um, quite questionable and who are not really transparent. transparent. Uh, I would like to focus on three examples because I think we have some blueprints how these disinformation uh, machineries are bringing democracies in danger. Uh, the first um, example I would like to mention is the, the topic of migrants. Right. Uh, we saw this in Germany with 2015 and 16 with this high influx of migration. And um, then um, the um, right wing uh, propaganda machinery started discrediting the migrants, uh, but also discrediting the government, uh, the Merkel government in that, in that case. Uh, and even though after 2016, we had a normalization of the situation, still right-wing right propaganda was infused in the internet. And it was, uh, the main narrative was that, you know, uh, we have a, mive, a wave of migrants and that brings Germany as a whole, the European Union, and especially the Christianity in uh, Europe at a risk. So um, that was what was really important. The fact that Germany is urgently needing um, uh, workers, for example, 260,000 annual per year, that was not mentioned. That was totally denied. So as a consequence, and this is highly important also, how could we learn from this example, is that we had a... At the, as a consequence, a new party, AFP, Alternative San um, in the German Bundestag right now, as a direct consequence of this right-wing, wrong propaganda machinery, we see that the uh, public discourse is highly radicalized. We saw attacks on uh, the Merkel government. Merkel must back. She has to be eliminated. Um, and I think this is a really very, very crucial example how also um, right-wing propaganda and uh, fake news are bringing also traditional democracies under pressure. So uh, coming back to a second um, example, these were the US elections in 2020. The Trump administration launched a tsunami of fake news during the whole of four years of Mr. Trump's um, uh, time in the White House. But this culminated in the, in the narrative of a stolen election after, after um, the election took place. Uh, last uh, last year, so the narrative was highly influential, and it wa was without, you know, any legal and factual base. In contrary, there were studies that this was one of the uh, most secure and security, I mean, elections in the history of the uh, of the of, of America. 
The Republican Party, nevertheless, was supporting these fake news and these wrong narratives. And as a consequence, we saw, a consequence, we saw the coup d'etat on the 6th of January, when really uh, a storm uh, 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 happened, a mob, a weapon, a mob uh, of right-wing extremists, but also ordinary people stormed the Capitol Hill and attacked uh, the police officers and everybody who was in charge to defend the Capitol Hill. So this was a clear attack on state institutions um, based on this wrong narrative Stop the steal. And again, I think again, I think we can learn of this as a blueprint how a functioning democracy at that time is really putting uh, is put under danger only by using a wrong narrative. So cybercrime that was mentioned before is only one thing. I think we have also to focus and to reflect. Um, those uh, propaganda machineries that are coming from the people in power and especially also um, in, in Southeastern Europe. So a third example for you know, these, um, these mechanisms, I would say was really the corona pandemic, pandemic. Uh, where we uh, saw well, that uh, the spreading, spreading of, of uh, fake news, of misinformation was a global phenomenon. Especially we had a trend that was undermining the confidence in state institutions and in the statements of um, health experts. We saw this in Germany, we saw this in, in, in America, we saw this in, 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 in Brazil, we saw this really as a worldwide trend, but especially also in the, in the Western Balkan countries. So at the end, we saw uh, two main uh, uh, consequences. There was the denial of the pandemic and the denial of the danger of the virus itself. And um, we were confronted with conspiracy theories of any kind. And behind that, studies uh, were brought out recently uh, in the US that these were individuals, but that it was pretty much also organized. Some of these trolls, yeah, uh, some of these organized, I mean, fake news were coming also from Russia. So um, as a consequence, we have clearly to state this is a hybrid war. It's a war about facts. And uh, the resistance of broader social groups um, did not accept, for example, the lockdown rules or the regulations. Uh, they didn't have any interest in the vaccination. So we saw also in this context, a radicalization of the public discourses and de destabilization effects. And for sure, this was also mentioned before in, for example, in Serbia, we saw a lot of attacks against the governments partly, but also against journalists and health experts. Um, so I think this also uh, as a third you know, topic was a really crucial example how these mechanisms are working. As a conclusion, and then I would like to, to end here my input, we really have to state that fake news and disinformation is becoming more and more a global challenge. And therefore we also need global answers. Um, I think it doesn't make any sense just to find a way only to, for example, to fight um, uh, fake news in Germany. I think really we need global agendas, global networks. Um, we have also to, um, to, to question the position of, of, of people in power when I saw also, uh, when we saw also um, last year death threats, for example, in Slovenia, this is a EU member state, right? And also their um, journalists were uh, being attacked just because they were doing their job. So we clearly have to state this is also a problem within the European Union. And I think we need, um, first of all, this was mentioned before also on media literacy, uh, on, 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 um, on education, but we need also platforms like this to exchange political discourses are needed on the problems and what we need. And that was discussed by me and, um, and Jabi recently. I think we should create a network for free media, especially in the um, uh, region of uh, Southeastern Europe because this is uh, completely missing so far. And um, yeah, we will proceed with this. Um, hopefully you will also join us in establishing this network. I think really this could help to make the problem, first of all, um, visible, and then to really to work on counter on countermeasures. Thank you so much.
Thank you, uh, Ms. Kraske, for this valuable input. I have some comments, but I would uh, like really to, to go ahead with the agenda. Uh, Tiana Svetichanin is next on our conference floor. She's a co-creator, editor and author of two fact-checking platforms in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Istinomir and later in Raskrinkavanje, she is currently working there, a media fact checking project. Also, lead editor of FemFacts, an international fact checking project of News, news Mavens, and a member of the advisory board of the International Fact Checking Network as of March 2019. Aside from her fact checking work, she has authored and co authored. Several research, several research studies and policy papers in areas such as political accountability, media discourse analysis, media freedoms, EU integrations of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and government transparency and openness. Quite an important portfolio. Uh, Mr. Tsvetichanin, I would uh, like you to share some ex uh, for you to share some of your examples from your everyday work since you are working in a fact-checking service, uh, I assume and I know uh, we are quite following you that you have daily examples of this radical rhetoric and hate speech that uh, tackles basic uh, democratic values and principles. So please go ahead with your thoughts and perhaps also with uh, uh, some ideas about the cure for our pain. Until we get uh, Ms. Tsiotichanin back, I would like to go ahead with uh, our distinguished professor from Macedonia, Professor Snežana Trpevska, has a PhD in uh, Communication Sciences. Her research interests are social research methodology, sociology of mass communication, critical thinking and media literacy, which was mentioned quite a few times at this conference, media policy and regulation and journalism studies. She work, worked as a head of Research and Strategic Development Department in the Broadcasting Council, which is now the media agency in our country, it's the regulatory body. She was a lecturer at the School of Journalism and Public Relations and a professor at the Institute of Communication uh, Studies in Skopje and participated in numerous academic uh, uh, and applied research projects on freedom of expression, media pluralism, media literacy, audience attitude and behavior in relation to media content, media concentration and broadcasting regulation. She has also quite a lot of experience in uh, ethics in journalism. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, more than enough for our audience and, uh, and for the uh, other members of the panel, I think, to, to give her uh, our full attention. Um, Professor Terpevska, we are glad to have you here uh, uh, with, uh, with us at the panel. Uh, two questions are arising on our discussion today. Uh, which are the most, uh, how to say, dangerous uh, aspects of this uh, radical rhetoric and hate speech which are endangering democracies through the public discourse? And is there any, from your experience, and you have quite a lot of experience in working in this type of projects, media literacy, uh, uh, confronting hate speech and hate uh, and uh, disinformation, is there any, any uh, how to say, uh, cr uh, a solid cure for, for addressing this, uh, this pain for our democracies? Thank you, Petri. Thank you uh, for the invitation uh, to this uh, interesting conference. And uh, I was not able to hear the last questions because there were some technical uh, problems, but anyway, uh, my um, main focus of uh, my brief discussion would be on where to find the solution, which is the, base, the best approach uh, we can adopt to, to, to tackle the problem of uh, the influence of new technologies in our societies, yes. and more specifically to the problem of uh, the huge disinformation spread. Uh, I'm now more interested, although I have worked a lot uh, in media policy issues and the regulation, I'm more interested uh, uh, on the demand side, on the reasons why audience actually uh, demands for 
uh, or is receptive uh, to, to disinformation, to fake news, and so on and so on. Uh, there haven't been much studies uh, in our country on these issues. Uh, we, uh, three years ago, there was a study commissioned by the regulator, if you remember, uh, a huge uh, uh, survey on the individual levels of uh, uh, media literacy in the country. Uh, there are also some other studies that, uh, that uh, just uh, grasp the issue, the reasons why audience uh, in our country, uh, more specifically, uh, behave uh, or um, is, uh, is so much uh, receptive to disinformation, but um, mainly uh, uh, the knowledge that is uh, uh, that is achieved uh, in uh, uh, research, uh, in social research in other countries is uh, also uh, explains actually uh, uh, the reasons why the audience behave like this. Uh, uh, it is a fact uh, that social media uh, in our countries as well uh, is becoming the main way of accessing news, especially for the younger generations. Uh, it is also known that social media continues to contribute to the increasing distribution of user-generated information, which includes false claims, fabricated news, disinformation, conspiracy theories, uh, theories uh, hate speech, and so on and so on. Uh, uh, but uh, before um, I move to the main points of my discussion, where to find the solution of the problem, uh, uh, let's uh, not forget uh, that this wealth of information and digital news outlets uh, uh, has revolutionized and democratized uh, uh, the politics. The public can scrutinize what politicians are doing in real time and comment on it almost instantly via social networks. So let's not forget the positive aspect of the problem. We are, uh, we are repeating now because we are facing the problem of, uh, of spread of disinformation and the negative influence uh, this phenomena uh, 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 reflects in our societies. Um, so what's the problem uh, here? The problem, the answer seems straightforward. The digital disinformation is a huge problem because for most people, for most of the people, it is not easy at all to distinguish to distinguish credible uh, news from disinformation, fake news, or manipulation on social media. media. So, so that is the core of the problem. Why people cannot recognize what is credible news, what is disinformation? Uh, but the solution of the problem is uh, is not straightforward. We can easily describe the problem, but the solution is not simple. Which approach is best one? Whether to apply restrictive or positive measures, whether to ban some content or to work on raising the awareness uh, of the population. So both approaches have their advantages and disadvantages. For example, legislation banning disinformation and fake news may infringe upon individual rights and freedom of speech. And on, on top of this, online information is extremely hard to regulate because it spreads like wildfire on social media. So uh, it, is not, uh, uh, it is not a simple solution just to adopt uh, restrictive measures in the regulation. On the other side, campaigns and short-term educational programs can only partially make changes in the awareness and skills of the population to recognize this uh, disinformation. Probably the best solution would be to combine both approaches, uh, to be extremely careful in introducing restrictive measures, but, but at the same time to implement thorough and long-term interventions in other societal areas. Like for example, the education system, formal education system, then self-regulation, strengthening the role of the family, uh, the professionalization of the media, uh, the role of the civil society sector. So I think that in our countries, actually, uh, uh, what has been achieved so far is more on the side on the civil society sector and on running uh, 
uh, a uh, uh, comprehensive media literacy campaign then on um, uh, engaging in a thorough uh, reforms of the formal education system. And that is the problem uh, we are facing now. now. So we know that media information literacy um, has become a critical skill since the appearance of the notions of fake news and later disinformation in the public discourse. Uh, uh, today, everyone talks about media information literacy as part of, so, of the solution. Uh, this is a kind of basic prerequisite to identify, select, understand, and use trustworthy, trustworthy information and to participate in the public discussion. However, my argument here is that media and information literacy cannot be the solution for the problem of the disrupted public discourse if its focus is not on developing critical thinking skills among the population. And this is a very complex and slow process that can only be achieved through a carefully designed reform of the formal education process at all levels. In our country, for example, there have been a huge number of edu educational programs, awareness raising campaigns and various other initiatives. And there are also announcements that media information literacy will be introduced in the formal education uh, system uh, in the beginning of September this year. But my dilemma is how will these reforms be implemented? Will they be implemented thoroughly based on the scientific evidence gained so far on how through the learning through the learning process the individual can adopt a critical or even better to say scientific way of reasoning or they will be implemented in a way that only few thematic units in media literacy will be introduced within some social uh, science subjects within the uh, formal education so I think that the biggest problem with our education today is that it doesn't teach students to think critically. Uh, although there is a widespread consensus regarding what skills, uh, what skills consti constitute critical thinking, as well as substantial research on how those skills can be taught successfully within the formal education process. I don't think that this knowledge has been taken into account in while designing the reforms, at least in our country. I don't know how is, uh, what is the situation in other countries in the region. And uh, I'm not uh, optimistic uh, that the solution will be visible soon uh, for that reason. So I will end here, this main point of my discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Trpevska, for your valuable input. Uh... Uh, uh, next on our uh, list of panelists, I will, I will try to again reach uh, uh, Ms. Svjetičanin, but I'm not seeing her. Maybe it's uh, with another nickname on the Zoom. Is it Propulsion or I don't know, but uh, we, will, we will go ahead until we get this information with uh, Bojan Kordalov. He's a distinguished uh, uh, expert in uh, senior communication specialist in PR and social media which is one of, the, one of the reasons for our pain, let's say. Uh, he worked on researches, consultancy, training for institutions, media organizations, uh, civil society organizations. He is quite experienced in digitalization and digital literacy, EU integration. He has a portfolio both in the civil sector and in the governmental sector on this issue. Um, uh, also certified trainer in multiculturalism. Uh, his specialities include digitalization, consultancy, project management, legislation, drafting, planning, researching, etc. I wouldn't go um, uh, much too long, Boyan, but we need your valuable input here because you're quite, quite uh, skillful in social media, especially. Uh, what's happening there and how does this, uh, uh, where does this discourse emerge from? Um, a little bit also about the targets. There are usual targets. We have one of those uh, at our panel today. Uh, and uh, is there any 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 way to, to confront this uh, this phenomenon? Well, thank you, Petrit. Thank you, and the civil uh, for this uh, valuable event. And I believe that we will contribute 
with these uh, questions, discussions, etc., etc. So first of all, I would like to, to, to say two things. That uh, is the first thing is that the majority of the population is actually not part of this process of uh, fake news and hate speech. Although those who are doing that are very loud and going at the first place because they are doing really bad job uh, and we see the consequences in the previous decades of that. Uh, especially we see the consequences now when we live in a digitalized era, when we live in a society which is based on internet technology, spreading the information not just from a village to village or city to city, but uh, around the globe, around the world. But also uh, we have to mention, this is the second thing, that the social media actually are tools, just tools, just tubes. They are not life, they are not media such as the traditional media which are led by the journalists, editors, uh, uh, camera persons, etc, etc. These are just tubes. And actually behind each fake news or each hate speech lies or stands a real person with a name and surname. So it's not the social media as itself spreading the, the fake news or the hate speech, but a person, personality. That, that's very important as a start of, of, of the discussion. Um, I will say that there are two main questions when discussing these very, very important topics. Uh, first is how to encourage debate, real debate, uh, without hate speech and without discrimination. That's, that's what we have to answer and try to answer. And the second is how to make the real news, or one of the, 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 the participants previously said, just news. How to make news uh, and information more worthy or more clickable than the fake news? This is the one million dollar questions that we should work on, not just debate, and find the, the answers because if we find this answer, we can uh, focus on, on, on battling and, and winning this, 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 this battle. So I will give one of the answers again with a question. Uh, how many of the institutions that you know all of you here and virtually, I actually, or public authorities have moderation policies on their social media accounts. How many of them? Uh, moderation policies that encourage debate, which means they discourage hate speech, discourage fake news, uh, and most important, take concrete measures against this. I'm not talking about negative comments, which means I disagree with your policy, which is fine, which is democracy. But I'm talking about comments with a hate speech, with discrimination, with uh, a lot of uh, uh, fake news. I will say uh, my answer will be almost none. What's yours? You can name it, maybe demand me, or maybe just confirm that that's true. So uh, I don't think uh, there is a need, especially for us here and on the other side of the, of the auditorium virtually, to remind that the hate speech may lead and actually leads towards concrete criminal acts. That's, that's true because uh, it's most probably that a lot of the people that use hate speech may do something which is really criminal and problematic uh, at, at that moment or maybe later. But my main topic, and I will give a conclusion with this uh, for today, will be what what's the focus or what public institutions can, can do in this important fight. Because these two processes, as you have put in this agenda, the hate speech and the disinformation, are really problematic and we should tackle as a one. So, <laughs> what actually the, 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 uh, the, the public institution can do? First is act. They should start acting, not just talking. Uh, acting most in prevention, but also to be more effective in sanctioning all the, all the criminal things that are happening in these two, two topics. Second, creating atmosphere for debate through inclusiveness, uh, and uh, which will include, that means different opinion, especially different opinion that are different from the actual government parties in power. This is not just for now, it's for the past. It must refer also to the, to the future, because we must, uh, we have to actually agree that democracy means different opinions. But it doesn't mean opinions with a hate speech, a discrimination, and fake news. 
but means different opinions because the debate is crucial for the democracy and for, for fighting these negative, negative topics we are discussing. Um, third thing, creating moderation policies that we spoke about. Because as in the regular criminal law, when we talk about predictability uh, of, of what you should do or should not do uh, and have a sanction, the same thing should be applied here, which means moderations policies have to clearly state what's not acceptable on the social media of the institutions, of the public authorities, clearly sta uh, state what's not acceptable because it's going at, uh, against the law and it's problematic. So which means moderations policies, which will encourage debate on arguments, encourage, argument, uh, encourage uh, debate on facts and not on hate speech. Uh, the fourth thing, uh, I think also the, the, the professor before me mentioned the education process, which is really, really important. And I won't uh, take a lot of time to, to, to say this because it was mentioned before, but those institutions should be an example in creating inclusive communication and educate how to do it. Because we need more personal, more institutional examples than a debate. And the, five, the fifth um, and the the final, uh, the final um, advice, which will help us uh, fight and battle these this two negative uh, phenomena, is giving professional, timely public services. So each public institution must give professional services because that will lead towards satisfactions uh, to all citizens, which will make fake news, but also hate speech really, really decreasing, because uh, giving equal access to everyone, which is really important, uh, taking steps, concrete steps against discrimination, which leads through the, through the uh, pr uh, example that public institutions should do, uh, can, make, can make the change. Actually, I strongly believe that this is just one part, but as a start of discussion, uh, this will be the main start for our journey, and it will help us to win these two, two battles. One against the fake news, and uh, the second uh, against uh, hate speech and discrimination, which are really problematic and which combined together makes the society looks like it looks now. And if we do not take concrete measures now, that means that maybe later will be too late. Thank you, Boyan, for this uh, valuable input uh, and uh, speaking of uh, of uh, the the damage that can uh, these two uh, two let's say big big uh, topics of fake news and this uh, and disinformation and the other one of hate speech and discrimination and radical uh, uh, offensive rhetoric on on the social networks. Uh, we have a typical example of uh, a distinguished activist from North Macedonia, Mersiha Smilovic, uh, coming from Legis, an organization quite prominent in working with helping migrants. Uh, you were there during the whole refugee crisis and the several waves. Um, she raised her voice against the disrespect of human rights, in particular in these cases of migrants and refugees, but also in other fields. Uh, also, their organization is uh, popular for its hum uh, humanitarian work. In the last several years, unfortunately, she is also a prominent victim of frequent orchestrated hate speech and uh, fake news attacks on social networks. Mercija, welcome to our conference and our uh, uh, panel. Uh, uh, please share your experiences. Uh, you have also litigated some of these cases in front of the public pr prosecutor, uh, reported some cases to the police. Are there any outcomes? And what do you propose as, 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 as a person who deal, deals with these issues every day? What do you propose is the main way forward, let's say? Thank you, Petrich, for the introduction. And thank you, Civil, for this uh, very important conference and a very important topic. Uh, the hate speech is very actually happening on the Balkans, like the previous uh, session, uh, several of the 
several speakers mentioned the Balkan and the countries in the Balkan region who are more fragile to this uh, fake news and uh, this uh, hate speech uh, who affect uh, everyone, affect the society, affect the human rights approach, but also make our democracy fragile. Because we see uh, on the era of the fake news, on the era of the hate speech, you see how the principles of human rights being put uh, outside. As you mentioned, my personal case, but the uh, groups that I'm a focus of protection, uh, it's a perfect example. It's a basically a case study that we can be, we can speak, I can work in the university or the professors to uh, to do a research. I will just mention a very interesting moment about the refugee crisis and the migration uh, issue. In 2015, uh, when the Macedonia was uh, the uh, part of this uh, huge. Uh, uh, way of like so-called the Balkan route, uh, two refugee camps uh, were made in the in, on our on our land. One on the border with Greece, one border with Serbia, and we had previously two refugee camps, asylum center and center for foreigners. So that was 2015 when it was the previous government uh, on power. So millions of refugees and migrants cross our Balkan route. We changed the law, which make more uh, respectful for the human rights and dignity of the refugees and migrants. But in 2017, when the same political party was in opposition. It started a huge campaign uh, and, uh, with uh, hate speech and uh, fake news against the refugees and migrants, saying that we, if the, this government on the local election win, it will build a refugee camps on Five the million uh, yes. refugees were, were mentioned that yes, would come we, to Macedonia. We would, we would be the largest community in the earth that uh, uh, has a place for the refugees and migrants. What was this case? And we were trying, as like you said, was the solution for the fake news. We think it's a counter-argument. Countering the arguments is the solution. But what happened in 2017? We felt speechless. Uh, we, f we thought that we are in some uh, hall and we speak like, no, it, it, the camps are finished, it was built in 2015, this go that government at that time built this refugee camp, so it's finished, but nobody wanted to listen. It was a huge campaign. It was not only on the social media, it was collecting signatures on the street. It was making, uh, in one uh, session in the assembly of the Macedonian, uh, uh, where the, when the people there are paid from our money, 87 times was mentioned the word migrant in one session. So it was not only fake news on, or on the social media, like the, you mentioned the tool. It was huge, organized, massive propaganda against the refugee and migrants. So what that meant? It, uh, it meant it, the dehumanization of the refugees and migrants. So after the local election 2017, everything went uh, down forward. So for us to raise empathy toward refugees and migrants now, it's very hard because everybody sees them as a, they will come, they will invent our country, they will build. So every new building that is built in our country, it's taken by the political parties and said, this will be the new refugee camp, this is migration camp, this is etc. So they are preventing normal functioning. So what is happening? We have Center for Foreigners. In all the European Commission uh, reports, it's mentioned that we have to have better conditions in the Center for Foreigners. It means foreigners, like everyone, not Macedonia citizenship, citizen, it's a foreigner. But it's preventing to do so, to, be, to build new building, because this one is in very crowded uh, municipality, Chai, and very crowded uh, area it calls Gazibaba, so you cannot pass. So it should be built outside the city, but it's prevented because even this political um, government, it's, it's a political. So they are scared about how the influence and this uh, hate speech and so they are preventing this building a new place. It will be more humane and more uh, better for the foreigners who will be in this detention center because they are afraid of the narrative that you will build a camp, a camp so you will build camp. So now we, we have a very huge uh, effect of the human rights of the refugees, but also for us as a civil society, it affects the empathy and solidarity. So if you want to do the hate speech toward one group, you have to first dehumanize them. So when you r remove the hu human aspect of them, you treat them as a group, as a collective movement, they will enter, they will enter your country, then it's very easy to attack, attack them with a hate speech. So also me being vocal on this area of the hate speech uh, towards refugees, but also the Islamophobia which is rising on the Balkan, which is very interesting to have Islamophobia today in 21st century when we are here as the Balkan, as a such a diverse 
a, a place which many ethnicity works, lives and function. We have mosques for six centuries in, the, in Macedonia. To have rising of Islamophobia now, when you have the, in New Zealand uh, the attack, the terrorist attack of the Christian church community place, then you become more scared because the attack that happens on me are several characteristic. It's because of my uh, vocal speaking about the refugees and migrants, because my visible representation of the uh, faith, they also attacks because of my gender. I was attacked because women with headscarf cannot be political active. Then I was attacked of my ethnicity. When there was a Srebrenica, because in Bosnia uh, nationality, uh, there was some political party who said, uh, if you attack me because of me, do you want again to happen Srebrenica? So he used this in month when we really, we really feel, uh, uh, I don't know, some emotionally uh, moved. So yes, I started se several initiatives. I went to the public prosecution. I went to the Ministry for Interior. I also have my pre uh, personal uh, lawsuit against some, uh, some uh, uh, not social media, but basically newspapers. Uh, only from until several cases that I mentioned, only one. I have only one uh, finished. It's uh, my personal uh, lawsuit against uh, two publishing houses uh, that they do the. Um, uh, they apologize for, uh, at the court, but still the sentence. It they was the case for slander and libel. Yes, and I guess. it was the case of, uh, when I was attacked that I'm anti-Semit. So the uh, the journal, the editor of the newspaper said that he uh, deliberately uh, said for me that I'm anti-Semitic and start this whole campaign for anti-Semitism. Uh, also, I'm a trainer for anti-Semitism, so I really know how and where what is the anti-Semitism. So he apologized, and uh, I'm expecting the verdict to have it in my hands so that I can publicly announce. But what's the, that is not only this newspaper, but also a political party, which has a lot of uh, followers, uh, uh, organized two several uh, press conferences against me. Uh, what is that important? Because I'm, uh, I'm a member of civil society. So if a political member, if the somebody member of the assembly attack a member of the civil society, that is a very huge attack because they also send a message and make you a fragile and you are scared to go outside because uh, 300, I don't know how much followers this political opposition, the highest political opposition in our country has. So the fake news and hate speech personally affect you, um, uh, send you some message that you have to be quiet you are scared to enter in the social media. You are scared to write your own opinion on the social media, media because you are you are afraid that they will use it, misuse it, and they will attack you because of your uh, your freedom of uh, speech. And I'm civil society member. I work in the private sector, so not I'm not a governmental institution. I'm not politician. So that is very important and very something that happens maybe six years for, for me now. Would you, would you encourage other people to take legislation measures? Because, I mean, obviously you say that uh, only one of the cases work, but that still one of the cases work. Maybe yes. this is one of the solutions to litigate these people, to litigate these political parties and make them apologize or even take harder consequences for their acts. When I start the procedure uh, through the governmental bodies, to the ministry, because it's a, it's a criminal code, uh, it's it's an article in the criminal code, so I cannot do my personal, I cannot they go have to, to do it civil, ex yes, it, it have to go through the criminal code and criminal court. Uh, I wanted to say publicly to the people, don't go, don't try this because it's very hard, it's very painful to go to the public prosecutor office, to, ha to have at your home coming a police officer bringing you invitation to come to the, their office. You know, for us as a family, this was very disturbing to have a police uh, car, big car, coming and they say, you're, uh, you're Mercija, you are invited tomorrow to a police station, and you are the victim in all these places. You go to the public, prosecu public prosecution office, and they were not trained how to deal with the victims, and she was attacking me, and at the end of the, uh, at the end of my interview, interview she told me like, come on Mercija, leave, uh, leave social media behind, you have kids, take care of your kids, take care of your home, be a housewife, like that. She, she said to me literally, and that passed one year and a half, nothing happened. So I was in the public prosecutor office, I went to the Ministry for Interior, 
so nothing happens. Even the attacker who is doing the, who did a personal attack on me by name and surname, by my ethnicity, my religion, my uh, pointing my family, he still has his Facebook page, Facebook profile. He still received salary from the our budget that we give, and he's not even any process has a start against him. And yesterday he also again had this hate speech, this rhetoric of Islamophobia, xenophobia on the social media, and you report to the Ministry of Interior, and nothing happens. Nothing happens. So this the institution has the biggest. Uh, point of them uh, to show them that they have to do more. Also, we as a civil society, we do more with uh, empathy, with solidarity, with a countering argument, but the institutions are very silent in Macedonia when we speak about hate speech and fake news. This is very disturbing to know. We hope that will change. Uh, uh, next on our panel is uh uh, Mr. Vladimir Georgievsky, who is uh, the head of the local branch of uh, RICO, the Re Regional Youth Cooperation Office in North Macedonia. They are, uh, uh, they are quite active in youth, of, uh, in youth networking and quite prominent in, all, in our country and also countries in the region. Uh, his youth work uh, extends to over 13 years, working with youth problems uh, and challenges. His experience includes working uh, uh, on youth engagement, natural protection, intercultural education, employment for youth, social entrepreneurship, but also on conflict uh, transformation, fighting hate speech, which is, which is one of our topics of discussion, and migration issues, where you have some uh, similar experience, I believe, with Mersiha. Uh, uh, Mr. Georgievsky, uh, thank you for coming at the panel. I hope you will share some of your insight on the issues and some of, uh, of proposals for way forward. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for having me and thank you for your great work that you are doing in this, this conference. I think it's, it's very important and we need more of, of this kind of conferences and events. And working on this topic, I think this is uh, this is good start that we discuss and uh, hearing all this uh, uh, previous experts and speakers, I, I will just add some things, I will try not to repeat what the previous guest uh, said. Uh, but generally we are living in the 21st century where informations are going so fast and information is power, uh, but informations are very easily, uh, people are manipulating with that information. That's why I personally believe that we need more regulations. Uh, state regulation, but also in maybe regional and European re regulations, because we can see what uh, what uh, politicians are are doing. If we go analyze uh, Hungary, Turkey, <laughs> and and here and what was happening previous, uh, with uh, how many journalists ended up in prisons and many people because what they were they were saying uh, against some politicians or they were they, they were true facts. Uh, but now, nowadays, also we have to see in, uh, journalists uh, in the media media platforms. We have to also analyze. People have to be generally more critical to analyze the the structure. Who is owning that that medias? Why why they are having these medias? Are they really earning from the medias from the from the uh, from them, or they they have several companies behind? So so why why are they they doing? Why are they saying what they are saying? Uh, and generally, Western Balkans divided society. Uh, medias are influencing a lot, unfortunately, more in dividing people still than than uniting people. Uh, and we have to 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 teach, especially starting from youth. What the previous uh, expert said to to think analytically, critically, and between the lines to see what the what the media is trying to say. And because we have a lot of cases. Is not, unfortunate it's not just Mersiha and we have been, most of us have been on the medias uh, uh, by like trying to attack us with fake news or lies. Uh, in that sense, RICO is doing, uh, started to, to work on this topic. Uh, we had more than 50 stories created by young journalists uh, from their reality. We had, for example, student who was writing about how his life in dormitory uh, or how how COVID influences the the own the online education how is uh, in that way, uh, but generally we need more and more stories uh, that unite us in the media than than divide us and 
uh, especially the power of uh, uh, not just formal education but also non-formal and informal we have to really focus there because uh, uh, RICO is giving some, some projects on, uh, on uh, media education, there is one, one uh, training that, that is dealing with that but it's just, uh, just a start, we need more funds, we need more, more uh, focus and if we look at our media, if you look uh, how how many serial um, movies we have. If I rem remember in my, when I was a teenager, it was movies that, that were really educating us. There were some uh, like more educational story than they are now. Now it's the narratives, and they are creating big narratives there so that, that we need to, to, to focus on more and more. And we have to work with, with several groups, like sport fans, like uh, uh, religious leaders, social media influencers, political leaders, especially youth wings, to educate them how to use the media properly because if we don't if we just use it to manipulate each other then we we will just be in the same place or go go back and uh, we will have more and more youth migration because it also influences a lot thank you vladimir for your valuable input i think this is a good message for uh, for the youth also to get engaged but be very careful uh, I wouldn't like to, to use any more of your time because you were, you, we were a little bit delayed with the, with the start of the conference and it pushed the agenda a bit further, but uh, I would still like to give the opportunity or the floor to all the participants at this conference. Uh, if they have a small intervention or a point in 30 seconds, uh, in a journalistic format, uh, uh, please uh, raise your hand so I can, I can see you. I think uh, Amina uh, Shurkovic is, uh, or, or the, sorry, I'm, uh, I see a raised hand at uh, Amina from Bedem. And then, uh, uh, then, is there any other, any, anybody else from the speakers who would like to, to join us with his final thoughts? Uh, Amina, please go ahead. Uh, our technician will un unmute you or unmute yourself now, so that uh, you give us your brief point at the end. Uh, okay, I would just like to ask a question. I have a question for Mercia, but also for the others, maybe who have been a victim in the same way as she is. Do you have or do you feel any support from the civil organization and from the other activists? from uh, your country or even from the region. Yeah. Please, merci. Uh, thank you, Amina, for the question. Uh, like I said, I was since I was attacked, to several characteristic. So I, I have to say that the most uh, support I gained when I was attacked of my gender perspective, when I was attacked that I, as a woman, I cannot be part of political movement. Then the feminist movement was very loud and very strong on the social media. Otherwise, it's not so much huge uh, support from the civil society movement. It's more personal activists, professors, and just approach to you. But sometimes the attack, attacks are so loud, are so strong that people are even afraid to do some public solidarization, so they send you messages. and. Uh, private messages, but it's not so much so so supportive uh, as it should be. I, I must say that uh, besides civil and several organizations, that we always stand by Mercija's activism because we we believe it, in its genuine <laughs> genuine genuinity. Uh, there is quite a lot of fear in our civil society. Uh, especially because it has been under attack for so many years, especially during the previous government. People were uh, from the civil society were dubbed as traitors, or soids, uh, uh, foreign mercenaries, etc. So quite a lot of people in the civil society choose to go under the radar of the nationalists and national chauvinists, uh, uh, especially or people who, who spread radical religious hate speech, or gender-based hate, hate speech. Uh, so uh, this is one of the things that we have to change. We have to be more, more and more supportive of of uh, 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 people coming from our sector. Not, but not not only. Every citizen is important. Uh, we had just a case a couple of days ago where a poet was 
uh, uh, was attacked on Facebook because uh, he said some words about a radical rhetoric of a politician. Then half a, an hour later, he received a fake profile by his name on Facebook, and that fake profile started speaking as the poet with very offensive, ha uh, harsh uh, hate speech against Muslims, Bosniaks, Albanians, Roma, etc. And we discovered this case, we reported it to the police. As you mentioned, we, we have to make the institutions work and deal with these issues because it's their job when these criminal acts happen to tackle these issues. Uh, any other uh, uh, intervention from the panelists? Please, please raise your hands or, uh, uh, so I can see you. I'm, uh, and if there is not, I would like to give the floor again to the President of Civil, Mr. Uh, Javier Derala, to conclude this conference. Please, Javier, here, here you go. Thank you. Uh, actually, I, I would like you to conclude uh, this uh, exquisite uh, uh, event. Uh, and uh, But I, I'd like to only make a couple of uh, points uh, that I somehow missed at the end of the first session because we were running out of time. Uh, one point I would like to make is that uh, the, the, there is a need for the institutions to start doing their job. As simple as that. That's one thing. The other thing is that we need to see more support for the independent media, but also for the progressive groups and the individuals in the society. We need to see media that have clear and unambiguous editorial policy that is progressive, that is decisively countering fake news, disinformation, hate speech, black propaganda, or et cetera, et cetera, which are the main tools that, or the most visible tools of the hybrid warfare that is being waged. And then I'd like to also uh, stress the point that the government have to be uh, accountable and have to be held held accountable for their for their uh, silence and for their actions, whether for good or for for the bad. And of course, I'd like to at the very end, if I make uh, if I may, uh, thank the whole team of civil and the whole team of uh, Balkan Forum, uh, who really worked very hard for this to happen. And it's not going to be the end, or uh, it will be the first but not the last conference on this uh, topic. And I'd like to help the desk of civil and uh, also the contributor, the, the colleague of uh, my friend Astrid, who came from Pristina uh, and worked on this. And I'd like to especially thank Dehran and Aryan who took care of, of, the, of uh, this to happen in, a, in the best possible way. And especially to all uh, uh, participants and to all speakers who really took uh, their time to contribute to this important event for us. Thank you very much. And here, here's the floor back to you. Sir. Thank you very much, Javir, for this intervention. I wouldn't take uh, any much more of your time. Thanks to the audience also who are following us for this two and more hours on uh, our channel, Facebook channel of Civil on Facebook, on Twitter, on uh, uh, YouTube and other media platforms. Please stay with us during these days because we will be transcribing all of the points of our distinguished speakers and they will be consec uh, consequently put on our uh, web platforms. Thank you all again for participating, for sharing your experiences, for attending the press conference and the, and the uh, live stream. We hope to see you very soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Civil Media. Slobodno, nezavisno, otvoreno.